introduce our first speaker, Ian Noakes. Ian is a farm policy analyst with OFA and will be providing us with an update on OFA's slow moving vehicle project. Ian, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Jason. Uh, as Jason mentioned, uh, this is just gonna be an update on one of the initiatives we've been working on at OFA. Um, this is uh, um, our slow moving vehicle campaign. And uh, the campaign began uh, last year with radio traffic report tags and social media spots through it the summer and fall, um, fall. And we also installed 64 billboards, two different designs uh, throughout uh, 29 farming communities or farming counties. Um, this is one of the billboard designs on the screen right now. I think I'll start my timer so I don't go over my time. Um, <clears throat> for 2023, we do plan to continue this campaign uh, awareness and promotion and some lower profile uh, media. And we also want to work with the Ministry of Transportation and local municipalities on road caution sign reviews. Um, so here's the issue. Uh, the road safety, Ontario publishes road safety annual reports every year. They estimate that some 10 million vehicles drive over uh, 140 billion kilometers on roads in Ontario every year. Um, now, each year, there's over 200,000 accidents, 50,000 injuries, and over 500 fatalities. Uh, on a per, ca uh, per kilometer basis, um, the collisions, injuries, and deaths don't seem that high. It works out to one collision for every 650,000 kilometers, one injury for 2.3 million kilometers of road travel, and one death for 244 million kilometers of road travel in Ontario. And uh, cars drive about two or 3,000 kilometers for each kilometer the slow moving vehicle is on the road. So we don't meet that often, but because of the size and comparably slower speeds of farm tractors and farm implements on the road, <clears throat> on a per a kilometer of road travel basis, these slow moving vehicles are 5.5 times likelier to be in a collision with 3.8 times uh, the fatalities. Now, 75% of those injuries and four to five of those deaths are occupants of automobiles and the balance are, are the uh, drivers of the slow moving vehicles. <clears throat> now, so why the difference between car, two car accidents and car accidents with slow moving vehicles. Well, improved road ne networks bring higher speed traffic and more traffic into these farm communities. <clears throat> Ontario has undergone significant road expansions and improvements. Even 50 years ago, rural roads were loose gravel, single or two lane roads. West and north of Ottawa and Barrie, many of these roads were unimproved earthen roads. Different vehicle speeds and higher traffic volumes were not a large concern for farmers on tractors driving dirt roads. If a car is only going five or 10 kilometers faster than the tractor, it takes 36 to 72 seconds to close a 100 meter gap to that tractor. Now, as populations increase, people and commerce expand into areas beyond the GTA, beyond London, Belleville, Ottawa, on a new, 400 series uh, highways. By 1965, the 401 was almost continuous from Windsor to the Quebec border and travel was multi-lane uh, past Barrie and soon into Sudbury, North Bay, Sioux, St. Marie areas. <clears throat> Over the most recent 20 years, the length of our road network, network expansion has slowed as attention shifted towards improving rural roads uh, lying between cities. All of these improvements have brought more vehicles traveling higher speeds into our farming communities. Now, it takes six to nine seconds for a car on a secondary road to close that 100 meter gap. It's, it's simple math, 80 kilometers versus 20 to 40 kilometers an hour for the slow moving vehicle. <clears throat> this is the second billboard that we, we used last year. Um, 
And uh, this is uh, a comprehensive SMV campaign we're running. Uh, it includes looking at things like highway design. Highways are now designed to accommodate more vehicles driving faster speeds. And uh, this design plays a key role in safety. Roundabouts, for example, are, are good. They force uh, all traffic to intersect in one direction and this tight traffic circle necessitates reduced speeds. From the farmer perspective, roundabout design should consider uh, needs to build in enough time for traffic to reduce their speed before entering the circle so that they're not coming in too fast. Uh, we would like to see these uh, circles have a radius that is large enough to accommodate long and wide loads uh, to properly negotiate the circle. And we would like to ensure that the curbs are flattened to allow these larger pieces of equipment to negotiate the circle safely. When it comes to the actual road design, uh, we feel it's very important that shoulders are wide enough to accommodate machinery and the grading is not too steep, uh, the declines in the, uh, in the grades, um, to, to accommodate these vehicles safely. Uh, when looking at resurfacing roads, crews should make sure that hydro line vertical clearances are maintained, especially at farm entries, uh, to make sure they can accommodate the height of this large farm equipment. Considering that some farm machinery is very wide, we would also recommend that municipalities ask their local resident, residents to keep objects such as garbage and recycling com containers off of the shoulder. When we look at the curving roads leading up to bridges or underpasses, it is important that the curve radius here is not too sharp either. So long equipment and vehicle towing implements can enter these bridges or underpasses without needing to back up probably numerous times. This also goes for intersections that are very near to these same bridges or underpasses. So uh, going to year two of this slow moving vehicle campaign, the OFA is planning to support farmers that are looking to initiate a review of their local government's slow moving vehicle caution sign plans. These are the signs that are approved, the types of signs that are approved by MTO for the roads that they administer. And they're also the appropriate signs for municipalities to use on their roads. <clears throat> These are good initiatives for uh, grassroots in initiatives to approach your council with. Um, uh, we, they're good for the council to adopt. Uh, we all want to be careful where the signs are install, installed and how many signs are used. And we all want safe roads and observant drivers. Uh, overusing these, these signs numbs drivers, uh, numbs their observance. Uh, so we would like to ensure that they're uh, placed in key areas, uh, for example, construction zones, school zones, and in our case, uh, in areas in farming communities. And, and finally, uh, just the uh, last thing that we want to continue while we're looking at uh, this campaign for 2023 and beyond, uh, we will continue to drive awareness and promote best driving habits. Uh, and things that just to, to kind of sum it up, some things that you want to know to ensure that you have a safe trip and so do the other folks on the road. Uh, remember, slow moving vehicles may only drive up to 40 kilometers an hour. Uh, Farm equipment needs to stay on the, pro on the uh, travel portion of the road for safety reasons. All vehicles must maintain a lane. Uh, so we want uh, farm uh, vehicle drivers to avoid driving part on and part off the road as much as possible, uh, considering how wide their loads are. Drivers must also ensure that they yield the, oncoming, the full oncoming lane uh, to oncoming drivers. And drivers, uh, mustn't expect that slow moving vehicle to pull over on the shoulder. As I've discussed, this could be very dangerous for large pieces of equipment. SMVs turn into farm field approaches that other drivers are not used to being to seeing. So both parties need to be aware of that. Uh, and finally, before you contemplating uh, contemplate passing a slow moving vehicle, we would like to ensure that you match your speed closer to the slow moving vehicle. And once the path is clear, make sure the SMV driver can see you before you pull out so we can all get home safely. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Uh, our next speaker uh, in the update session is Megan 
So both Megan is the manager of research and policy at the Greenbelt Foundation. Welcome, Megan. Uh, we look forward to your presentation on the soil health benchmarking project. Take it away. Great, thank you so much. Uh, just one moment. So yes, my name is Megan Sufos. I'm the manager of research and policy here at the Greenbelt Foundation. And today I'll be sharing a bit of information about a new program we're launching this year. The Greenbelt Foundation and the US-based Soil Health Institute are partnering with Ontario agricultural organizations, including Ontario Soil and Crop Improvement Association, Soils at Guelph, and Ontario Certified Crop Advisor Association to develop an, uh, an innovative assessment and management protocol uh, in Ontario. To, today, we're developing what's an interpretable, scalable, and locally relevant method for evaluating and monitoring soil health. This project will serve as a pilot within the Golden Horseshoe that is designed to be scaled across the province and to additional soil types and cropping systems. In conducting this pilot, our goal is to increase the adoption of BMPs across the Golden Horseshoe by helping farmers answer the important question of how healthy is my soil? This approach was designed by the Soil Health Institute under the basic concept that you can't manage what you cannot measure. So if a farmer asks, is my soil healthy? Sure, these indicators presented here provide results and numbers, but compared to what? And what do they mean? There is no inherent meaning to any one of these numbers or a direct link to the intuitive function that these indicators are measuring. So how do we say what's high and what's low, what's healthy and what isn't? Our project is taking this concept from the Soil Health Institute, what we're calling soil health benchmarks, and applying the concept here and on the Golden Horseshoe. So putting soil health results on a continuum from the baseline or typical farming practices to the best you can possibly get or what you'd commonly see in perennial grasses. And this is, and the, in the middle you'd see where those soil health systems or those systems that are using a suite of BMPs would fall. This provides a way for farmers to understand how healthy their soils are today and how healthy their soils can become. These benchmarks are established locally by grouping similar soils based on texture and drainage classes. That way a farmer will know that the soil health improvements that are possible on their farms are actually possible because other farms with similar soil types are achieving better soil health test results. This is an interpretable, scalable, and locally relevant method for evaluating and monitoring soil health. After conducting a soil health test, a farmer will see where they fall in the continuum and set individualized goals based on their needs. Over the next four years, we'll be providing free soil health sampling for three to 500 grain and oil seed farmers across the Golden Horseshoe that fall into one of the four, four soil health groups visualized here. Over the next couple of years, we'll be focused on collecting sufficient data to develop the benchmarks for each of the soil groups. So this requires us to collect a sufficient amount of samples from within each of the soil groups, from a range of farming systems, and with a fair distribution across the region. Because we're looking for a representative sample, eligibility is not necessarily guaranteed by signing up. We do invite anyone who's growing corn, soy, or winter wheat to, within the Golden Horseshoe region to sign up for a quick eligibility call on our website. This will allow us to determine if the site's a good fit for our study and allow us to answer any questions someone may have. If a farm is eligible, the grower will be asked to provide information about their soil management history, including information about the types of crops grown and the management practices that are used on the farm. Ideally, this discussion will happen on the farm when we visit uh, to collect the samples as it will help us to determine the best area to collect the composite sample. By participating in the program, growers will receive a comprehensive soil health report with locally relevant soil health interpretations for organic carbon content, aggregate stability, and soil biological activity. They will also receive one-on-one -on -one support from a soil health specialist to overcome barriers, whether that be education or, or, or navigating available incentive programs to implement a new BMP to improve soil health. If you're interested in sharing this opportunity with your networks, I encourage you to reach out to me. My contact information is on the slide here and I'll drop it in the chat as well. Or if you're a farmer yourself and have a site that you might want sampled, uh, I encourage you to visit our website uh, and sign up uh, on there. So thank you so much. I'll, I'll drop the information in the chat for anyone who's interested.
Thanks, Jason. Well, thank you very much, Megan. Up next, we'll hear from Peter Sikanda with an update on farmer mental health uh, research. Peter is a farm policy analyst with OFA. Peter. Thank you very much, Jason. Uh, just checking everyone can see my screen. It's a bit laggy, Peter. There we go. It, it, uh, it's not in um, in um, slide. There it is. Perfect. Yeah, okay. There we go. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I just wanted to do a quick uh, farmer mental health update. Um, first off, what an amazing year it's been uh, for farmer mental health and wellness uh, in Ontario. Uh, we've really managed to advance this issue uh, uh, so far and accomplished so much in what is relatively a short period of time. Uh, and we've managed to build uh, an amazing community of farmers, practitioners, uh, industry advocates, uh, all helping to create psychologically healthy, safe and uh, resilient agriculture sector. Uh, before I go into some of these accomplishments though, I really did just wanna thank uh, everyone who's been involved and worked so hard at promoting farmer mental health and wellness in Ontario. I know I can't get to everybody, but uh, I just wanted to thank everybody. Um, so first off, actually, uh, we have uh, the development of the Agriculture well Wellness Ontario. Um, I, this is a program that's uh, been pulled together with a number of stakeholders, uh, and it involves uh, three, three major programs in the know, uh, the Guardian Network and Farmer Wellness Initiative. Uh, in the know, some of you may be aware of already, uh, is a four-hour mental health literacy workshop, uh, which is created specifically to educate uh, the agriculture community. Uh, it's delivered virtually and uh, or in person and is really meant to be uh, education, uh, educational uh, information sharing opportunity uh, and provide options on where and how to connect with resources. Uh, it's de designed to fit with farmers and producers' schedules, uh, um, and it distills critical mental health and safety information, and uh, is really meant to uh, build the uh, into mental health programming the the culture of agriculture. Um, it's been a, a great pleasure to see this uh, program that uh, OFA has been involved in since the beginning uh, uh, roll out across Ontario and across uh, the country. Uh, the Guardian Network is a volunteer suicide prevention uh, network uh, which supports Ontario's farming community. Um, a Guardian is an individual over the age of 18 who is likely to be in contact with farmers through their work, uh, volunteer activities, or their place. Uh, or their place in their community and has successfully completed the Guardian Network training program. Guardians are equipped with strategies and tools to identify the signs of mental distress, uh, react to farmers at risk and connect individuals with appropriate mental health resources. Uh, we also have the uh, Farmer Wellness Initiative. Um, uh, it supports all Ontario farmers and their families, regardless of their status uh, or their membership. Um, this uh, program uh, provides free access to counseling sessions uh, with a mental health professional uh, to all Ontario farmers and their families, uh, regardless of farm organization membership. Uh, the, it's a confidential service, uh, which is accessible 24 hours a day, 365 days a year in English and in French, is provided by professional counselors with specialized uh, agricultural backgrounds and training. Um, uh, the counseling is available for any issue, not just, uh, oh, <laughs> scribbling on the screen, uh, not just uh, uh, farm related matters, including financial pressures, health concerns, depression, troubles with family, friends, partners, and spouses, uh, feelings of stress or burnt out, bullying, trauma, abuse, substance abuse, and other issues requiring support. Uh, more information about the Farmer Wellness Initiative uh, is available on the FWI website, which is farmerwellnessinitiative.ca. Uh, this year, we also saw the creation of the Canadian Centre for Agriculture Wellbeing. Uh, the centre brings together national and global leaders in the agriculture and mental health field 
to conduct cutting edge, cutting edge research uh, to develop uh, evidence-based community-informed programming and education to address well-being related challenges among Canadian farmers. Key pillars to the CCAW uh, research, uh, advancing mental health research and program development, uh, capacity building um, to build capacity within the sector uh, and by using research and program development to foster resilience among Canadian farmers. Uh, partnership, uh, solidifying uh, provincial and national partnerships, empowerment, supporting and empowering farmers and agri-food agri workers to take care of their mental well-being. This year also, we saw the first ever uh, National Symposium on Agricultural Mental Health. Uh, this was a national conference that brought together mental health professionals and farm advocates from across Canada to share updates on current activities and interventions, uh, lessons learned, uh, and next steps towards addressing mental health resiliency within the agriculture system. Uh, we look forward to this being uh, the first of a, a long running yearly symposium. And finally, uh, just as a final wrap up, uh, OFA is continuing to advance the issue of farmer mental health. Uh, we are continuing to collaborate with uh, Workplace Safety and Prevention Services, our Health and Safety Ontario providers, uh, to continue to create uh, psychologically safe workplaces. Uh, working with the Canadian Agriculture Safety Association to further uh, mental health awareness and develop uh, tools to support farmers. Uh, CASA has just launched a new online farm safety mental health and wellness hub uh, to bring together information and resources in one place uh, to support farmers, fa farm families, farm workers, and farming communities. Uh, and we are continuing to support uh, research on emerging issues. Uh, for example, uh, Andrea and Jones Bitten and our team at uh, the University of Guelph are launching a new research project to understand the impacts of climate change on farmers' mental health, uh, uh, how some farmers re remain resilient to climate-mediated cat catastrophic losses, uh, and what supports would help with coping um, and proactive adaptation to the climate crisis. Um, there's so much going on. I wish I could cover it all in such a short period of time. Um, but I thought I would just leave this uh, up uh, as a reminder that uh, if you uh, or know anyone who needs uh, support uh, to call this number. Well, thank, thank you, you very much, Peter. Um, next, we have an update on the fertilizer use survey from Nicole Mahir. Nicole is program coordinator with Fertilizer Canada. Welcome, Nicole. And I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Jason. Um, I don't have any slides to share, and I'm not sure my camera's working today. So um, this will be just a quick update on the fertilizer use survey and the results from 2022. I'll give a little bit more context in a couple minutes um, when we have the discussion panel. I'll have a little bit more time to give a bit of the context behind the fertilizer use survey. But basically, we have a voluntary survey that is online and is about 25 minutes. We give growers incentive to complete this survey, about $30, and there's extra incentive for Ontario growers who opt in to complete our manure portion of the survey. To complete this survey, you have to, we have had 100 Ontario corn growers, or sorry, 500 Ontario corn growers um, complete this survey. And to complete this survey, you have to have, I believe, 100 acres of corn um, grown growing on your farm in rotation. Um, we've been conducting this survey on 4R practices and general fertilizer use practices since 2014. So we almost have 10 years worth of data, which is really exciting. Um, and again, um, this survey is voluntary. So we have just lists of growers that we send the survey out to and collect data that um, it, that we don't share with everybody we collect, or we share with the public, but not all the data. We just share the big, um, the big uh, conclusions that we find year to year on for our practices. Um, and also a lot of this data can be found on our website. We just don't share raw data with everybody. Um, but it just lets us, um, gives us a little insight into for our practices across Canada as a whole. Um, currently, we have about 30,000 acres that have been surveyed um, year to year, uh, and then 
We also collect uh, for our acres that are under for our practices from our agronomists year to year, but that's a different story and I can get into that a little bit later, so. Well, thank you, Nicole. And with that, uh, I will ask uh, the other session speakers to turn their cameras back on and join us for some panel questions. Um, I am paying attention to the chat. I don't see any other questions in the chat right at the moment, but um, Nicole, if you wouldn't mind giving us a little bit of that context on the survey that you were <laughs> looking to in the panel, this would be perfect to start us right. off. Right, yeah, I so I do have a little bit um, more time to speak on the context behind the survey, but basically um, we're all aware of for our practices in Canada, um, using your fertilizer efficiency efficiently at the right um, time, the, sorry, the right type, time, place, and rate. Um, they're all really important to conserving our fertilizer use uh, efficiency and reducing the um, amount of excess or leftover fertilizer that gets lost to the environment via leaching or nitrous oxide emissions, which I'll speak a little bit more on to how fertilizer impacts nitrous oxide emissions in a minute. But basically, um, the our fertilizer use survey just aims to, across Canada, see what growers are doing on the ground to show the government that Farmers and agronomists are putting in the hard work to conserve our fertilizer use and use it efficient, efficiently um, and effectively. So, Well, thank you for, for that, Nicole. And, and as a follow-up question, uh, you did mention in the presentation that access to the survey data isn't provided to everyone. Who, who can access that survey data? Right. Yes. Thank you for asking that. I should have clarified that a little bit better. Um, so we do offer uh, our slides, PowerPoint slides of all the survey results to everyone. Um, you can just contact me. We just like to have, uh, we like to keep track of who um, uses the slides in case they have any cool research that they come out with um, from the use of the fertilizer use survey because we always wanna hear what people are finding out from the data. But, um, you can actually access the survey on our website. I believe I sent Janice the link to um, the data. Um, we have reports of summaries for the fertilizer use survey. And so it is technically open to the public, but we don't share things like location of the grower. Um, it's all anonymized, the data sets when they come to us, but we, we don't share exact locations and exact personal information like that. Well, thanks, Nicole. And we'll stay on that theme and we'll go over to Megan now. Megan, I, I mean, the uh, soil health benchmarking project is, is really just starting. Um, so you haven't started the data collection piece, but um, who will have access to the data when it is when it has been collected? Yes, yeah, so uh, there we will definitely have a, uh, a very strict data sharing um, agreement between our project partners. So in terms of uh, personal information, so uh, geolocation, name of farm, it would that information would just be shared with the Greenbelt Foundation and the Soil Health Institute uh, as it's needed to conduct the soil health uh, analysis after uh, the lab receives the data. And then in terms of sharing that data more widely, we will be sharing it to other project partners in aggregate. So sharing that with Ontario Soil and Crop Improvement Association, as well as AMAFRA uh, for ongoing research purposes, but uh, of course, sharing that data in aggregate so that there is no personally identifiable information within that data set. Well, thanks for that, Megan. And I do see that you put in the chat the link that people can go to, uh, www.greenbelt.ca slash Greenbelt Soil Health um, in order to be able to volunteer to participate in that. That's perfect. Well, that's all the time we have actually for this session. Thank uh, you for speakers for joining us today. Um, I will now pass it over to Janice for our last session of the day. <laughs>